Welcome to Westside Community Church. We are listening to a message by Pastor Rick Mavis titled Trust Busters. Let's join him now as he begins. Our focus is a theme that I began actually back in July called Trust Busters. God kept bringing to my attention Proverbs 3 5, which is our overall text for the whole series. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust is an issue for those of us who are seeking to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're here and just investigating, you haven't made that commitment to Jesus, you'll discover that we don't have it all together either. For us, we know God wants us to trust him. And I hear Christians say, I'm just trying to trust God in this situation. But the reality is that all too often we fall at least somewhat short of that. Because there are patterns, habits that get in the way, basically that take us down a path that leaves the option of trusting God kind of just off the radar. So we don't even tune in to what trust would look like in our lives. So let's pray and dive into God's word. We're going to look at another passage where God's people were wrestling with that issue of trust. Father, thank you for your presence here in our midst. Thank you that you are a God who breaks the chains, who desires to set his people free. Lord, whatever baggage we're bringing here today, may the power of the name of Jesus break it. Father, I don't come pretending to have all the answers, pretending to be such an eloquent speaker to convince people. We just rely upon your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to direct us, to reveal paths that we have taken, ways that we have fallen away from trusting you. Father, bring us back with your truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is God's desire that we trust him because God just doesn't just give us rules to follow, doesn't just give us teaching, but he desires relationship. And trust is essential in any relationship, whether it's our relationship with God or our relationship with other people. Trust is actually a, even a form of praise. It shows that we value God more than anything else in our life. So our goal is to trust him, and yet we find that that is often a problem. I want to turn back to a passage that I dealt with um, somewhat back in July, Deuteronomy chapter 1. The setting here is Moses is recounting what had happened with the people of Israel God had made a covenant in the past with Abraham, had promised a particular land, a geographic location that we know of as the promised land, the holy land. Um, God's people had been taken into captivity, had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Finally, they had been set free from Egypt. They traveled through the wilderness. They received the commandments from God. They're about ready to enter the land that God had promised to them. And Moses sends 12 scouts or spies into the land to find out basically what the situation is there. You know, is it good land? Are the people strong? Are they well armed? Are they numerous? Are we going to have difficulty taking possession here? And he makes, comes to a conclusion in Deuteronomy chapter 1 concerning um, the Israelites' Entering into the land, he says, but you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. He goes on to say that the people were saying, our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. And Moses concludes by saying, you did not trust in the Lord your God. He starts by saying, you, you rebelled, you disobeyed. But then he really gets to the reason behind that. You disobeyed, you rebelled because 
failed to trust God. And all too often, that's the case for us. Our behavior ends up being something other than what God desires. And yet it comes down to the fact that we have been unwilling, maybe haven't even considered the possibility of really trusting God in that situation. The Proverbs 3.5 describes it as leaning on our own understanding, going our own way, doing our own thing, relying on ourselves. I think the question that we have to face as we look at this is the why question. You know, the Israelites had a history with God. He had acted on their behalf. They're ready to enter this promised land. And actually, the report is pretty good. They're saying it is a land of bountiful crops. You know, the grapes are huge. The food's plentiful. It's a good land. And after wandering in the desert, you know, this would sound really great to them. And yet, they hold back because of what I would call a trust buster, a habit or pattern, a way of thinking that gets in the way of trusting God. We looked at this back in July and saw that one of the trust busters involved here was that they had believed a lie about God. They concluded, the Lord hates us. He's just taking us here to destroy us. And yet the reality was God had done a number of things on their behalf, set them free from their slavery in Egypt, He had parted the Red Sea so that they would escape the Egyptians. He had provided water. He would provided food. So he had acted on their behalf. So they realized that was a lie that God hated them. But I think there's another trust buster at work here, and it's one that I suspect is very prevalent in our lives, both in our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. So even if you're not on the walk of faith with God, I think there's some things that you can tune into in terms of relationships with other people. And the trust buster that we're going to look at this morning is the issue of asking the wrong question in a situation. That even if we have a correct answer to the wrong question, it takes us down the wrong path. In fact, there was a statement by Peter Drucker, who is an author of numerous books on leadership, business. Um, you know, most writers will fall back on what Peter Drucker has said. He made an astounding statement. He said the, mo- the important and difficult job is never to find the right answers. It is to find the right question. For there are few things as useless, if not dangerous, as the right answer to the wrong question. Think about that. We tend to grope for answers, and all the time we may be spinning our wheels because we're asking the wrong question to begin with. And if we come up with the right answer, it really doesn't resolve it. The most important thing is to find the right questions and then come up with the answers. Now, that may still seem confusing. I don't know if you're immediately thinking of examples. Let me give you an example from the text here. Israelites poised at the edge of the promised land, ready to enter. They've heard this report uh, from the scouts or spies that have described the bountiful uh, prosperity of the land, but also the fact that the people are numerous and that they're large, the cities are well fortified. The question they're asking is, are we bigger and stronger than the people in the land? In other words, can we on our own strength, defeat them. And they came up with a pretty obvious answer. No. <laughs> they are big. You know, there's uh, just sometimes there's some people you know you don't want to get into an argument with because they're here. And I say, no, don't measure up. Wisdom is to say, nope, I'm not as strong as that person. So... I don't want to enter into conflict with them. They had concluded that. In fact, there's a line in in, uh, the book of Numbers where it says, the men who went up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. 
I love that image. You know, it's one thing to say, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and psychologists say, oh, they've got low self-esteem and bad self-image, all this, but they say, well, actually, the people there thought we looked like grasshoppers, too, and where two or more are agreed, you can kind of conclude, yeah, maybe it's true. Compared to them, we're grasshoppers. You know, we just don't measure up. We don't have the strength. So it takes them right down the road of saying, oh, forget it. We're not going to enter the promised land. And what kind of bothers me in this is that Moses, the great leader, actually kind of set them up for this. Earlier in Numbers chapter 13, when he sends these scouts or spies into the land, he actually tells them to find out if the people are numerous and if the people are large. So that's what they were looking for. And they come away saying, yeah, they're like giants. Man, we don't want to fight them. And actually, it shouldn't be that surprising that Moses set them up for that because Moses himself fell into it. Back when God appeared to Moses and called him to go before Pharaoh to release the people from slavery in Egypt, Moses was asking the wrong questions. He was asking himself the question, am I important enough to stand up to Pharaoh? Mm, don't think so. Am I a, an eloquent speaker? You know, some people could sell somebody anything. He said, am I that convincing that I can convince Pharaoh because I'm such a great speaker? No, I don't speak well. So he protests to God saying, you know, I don't think I'm the right guy. You know, I'm not important enough. I, I don't speak well enough. We see it numerous times in Scripture. number of the prophets, when God called them, protest, well, I'm too young, or I'm too something, or not something enough. We just see the protest, but behind it is the wrong question. The question of saying, can I do it on my own? No. That's the correct answer. So I think it's important for us this morning, and I would challenge you right now, to think about what questions you are asking yourself. I don't know what tough situations you're facing, what conclusions you're arriving at, but back up a step and say, what question am I asking? And is it the wrong question? Is it taking me down a path where I'm going this way and God's over here somewhere, so I'm not even really thinking about trusting God? I know my tendency when I hear about some difficult situation is to start asking the question, what can I do to solve this? Okay, if I do this, if I do this, wrong question. First question needs to be, what's God doing here? Does he want me to even be involved in this situation? Or does he have some other plan involved? Does he have other resources? Somebody better equipped to deal with it? Or maybe it's not something to be solved at all. Maybe it's something just to be managed, to be lived with. The answer is not just positive thinking. I know we hear that a lot in our society. Well, just think positively. Well, if we'd gone to those Israelites and said, hey, come on, Israelites, you can take those enemies. You can do it. The reality is, no, they couldn't. They weren't bigger and stronger than their enemy. I grew up dreaming of playing baseball for the Detroit Tigers. Um, I mean, I couldn't even make the high school baseball team, let alone major leagues. The talent, the physical strength and ability was not there. It would be foolish to just say, well, God will work it out somehow, and I'm just going to think positively and go for it and devote all my time to pursuing that goal. Wrong. It's not a matter of positive thinking. Reality was the Israelites were smaller than their enemies. Reality was that Moses was not a particularly important person to confront Pharaoh and apparently didn't speak well. Gideon in the book of Judges protests that his family wasn't important, and it wasn't, and that he was the least in his family, and that was true. But that wasn't the criteria for whether God would use him to win the victory. And that kind of leads us to what the right question should be. Because we've talked about the wrong question, but the right question in this situation, one possibility, would be, can God give us the victory? 
Now, for the Israelites to face this, they say, well, okay, let's see. God promised Abraham this land. He's told us he's taking us out of Egypt to go to this land. He's now commanded us to enter this land. God has used the power to overcome all the Egyptians and get us free from Egypt. Hmm, yeah, you know, I think if God's in it, we could be victorious over these people in Canaan. You know, why not? If God is for us, who's going to be against us? It's not blind confidence just to do anything. I think all too often too many people quote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. But that has to be in the framework of saying, is this something God is leading us into, calling us into? Has he empowered us in the past in this way? Then yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Actually, the context there was Paul talking about learning to be content. I don't hear too many people <laughs> quoting that verse to say, I'm learning to be content with the little that I have. It's usually wanting more and I can do everything through Christ. But it's only as we are confident that this is what God wants for us what he has done for us in the past. There's another right question that can be asked both by the Israelites, but I would say also very much by us. Can God use me in working out his purposes? See, the focus is not, do I have the strength? Am I smart enough? Am I strong enough? Am I educated enough? Am I rich enough? Am I talented enough? Am I experienced enough? It gets the focus totally off of us. The focus becomes God saying, can God use me in his service? Now, at that point, we have to look at God's criteria for people that he uses in ministry. So to answer that question, I would suggest that we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth and telling the people there their background, and he gives us great insight into the kind of people that God used. So if there's something you're thinking, wondering if God's going to use you, see if you fit this job description, if you measure up to these criteria. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So there's your test. Are you foolish? Are you weak? Are you despised? Then you got the job. You meet the requirements. That's us, the foolish, the weak, the lowly. God doesn't want people that are so full of themselves and so confident in their own strength and their own abilities that that pride interferes with him using them. He wants the people that recognize their weakness. Those are the people that God uses. So if we ask the right question, not am I experienced enough or am I strong enough or talented enough or smart enough, rather to say, is this something God's calling me to do? Because if so, God can use my weakness to bring his glory. God did a really strange thing one time in the Old Testament. He had called Gideon to deliver the Israelites from their enemy, the Midianites. And Gideon gathers an army of 30,000 men. He's all ready to go after those Midianites. And God says, nope, um, too many. So he goes through a couple of steps to decrease the number in the army. And they're pretty drastic steps. It gets it down to 300. And then God says, now you're ready to go against the Midianites. 300 instead of 30,000. Because now you will know the victory comes from me, not from your own strength. So often God will use our weakness, our inabilities, to bring glory to him, to show that he is the one at work. 
one of the keys within this is to take responsibility for our own actions, attitudes, emotions, to take responsibility for our own life. Counselors report that there are times when they interview somebody, they just know it's going to be difficult for this person to see improvement, not because their problem is so great, but because they are shifting the blame to other people. They're not taking responsibility for their own life. And all the counseling in the world, if you keep saying, but, but it's my dad's fault, it's my friend's fault, or my situation's fault, if I were just in a better job, if I were in a better home, if I were, as long as we keep shifting it, it's hard to make progress. It's hard to find healing. It's hard to break the chains because we aren't taking responsibility for ourselves. It's interesting that the Israelites here, Moses cites that they said, Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger, etc. Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. Think about this. The brothers they're talking about are the ten spies who brought back the negative report. It's the mass of Israelites that say, ooh, that makes us afraid. Now there were two other scouts men named Joshua and Caleb who went in, and they came back with a report saying, yeah, let's go for it. God has given us this land. Let's go. Strange. It didn't make their hearts melt in fear. So apparently it was not automatic that fear would enter. It was a choice on the part of the Israelites. They could hear the report, yeah, the people are big, but if they kept their eyes on God, that would not lead to fear. Uh, we know later in the Bible, David faced the same thing when he faced the giant Goliath. If we don't listen to the voice of fear, but listen to the voice of faith instead, then we can take that step of trusting God. We are responsible for our attitudes, for our emotions. How we respond to situations. We can make the choice whether to set the fear aside and to move ahead in faith. There will be the initial emotion. I mean, you walk up, I'm sure, when David first saw Goliath, there was that momentary flutter of fear. That dude's big. But then he chooses not to go with fear, but rather to go with faith. Carrie, if you and the team will come, we'll be wrapping up shortly. We need to take responsibility for our own lives. Making that decision to set aside the wrong path, the wrong questions, whether it's in our relationship with God or a relationship with people. I remember hearing a story on a video for Love and War where a man was talking about his wife had asked if on the way to the airport they could stop and see this lady in the hospital and did so and the hospital was much, much farther off the path than he thought and it took forever and made him late, so he missed his flight. And he concluded being angry that she'd made him late and he was rehearsing in his mind, she always makes me late. See, he was asking the wrong question. The question he was asking was, did she make me late? Well, yeah, she needs to work on time management and discipline. But the real question in that situation, the right question for a spouse, is did she plan to do that? Did she plan to ruin my day? Did she plan to miss up my flight and my business appointment? No. Her heart was in the right place. If we ask the right question in our relationships with other people, it makes a huge difference in how we relate. If we ask the right question in our relationship with God, it makes a huge difference. It gets us on the path of saying, if I ask the right question, can God be in this? And what is God doing here? It allows me the opportunity to then take that step of trust. And I'll admit to you, trusting God is hard. This is not an easy thing. If somebody just says to you, oh, I'm just trusting the Lord in all these things, I'm sorry. 
I find that hard to believe that it's that easy. It's a struggle for all of us. It's a battle. The voice of fear will say, well, you can't do that, or you don't deserve that blessing, or you're not good enough, or you have failed God too often in the past. And the voice of faith says, but that's not the question. The real question is, am I willing to trust God in this situation? If I can paraphrase a, a line that Joshua had when he said to the people of Israel, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. I would say the issue for us today is choose in each situation each day whom you will trust. Because you're going to trust somebody. The Bible says the person who trusts himself is a fool. That's not my verdict, although I would agree with it. It's God's word. God desires for us to make the choice to trust him. Moses affirmed to the people of Israel, we find in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, affirming to God's people, God is for us. Friends, whatever situation you are faced as you're wrestling with whether to trust God, how you can depend on him in this, God is for you. Do you believe it? Amen. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Set aside the lies, set aside the wrong questions, and make the choice to trust the God who is for you. Moses, at the end of this passage, reminded the Israelites, he said, he will go before you, he will fight for you, as he has done in the past. Whatever you're facing this week, God will fight for you. He will fight for you. He is a warrior God. And life is a battle, but we're not on our own. Our God is for us, and he will fight for us in whatever we face. Our last song, Our God, is going to focus on that. So sing it, expressing the faith in whatever you're facing today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you next Sunday at our 9 or 11 a.m. service.